When it comes to BMX racers, they're always, you're always looking to improve, whether it be your gates, your power, your skills, your race IQ, your emotional and mental capacity. Which one of these do you guys need to focus on at the moment in an effort for you to achieve your goals? Let's talk about it. All right, microphone check, one, two, one, two. We are live. BMX Coach Live on YouTube. I am your host, Greg Romero, and I'm here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be your coach and guide you and help you with your BMX racing and training performance. Guys, welcome to the show. It is Monday here in San Diego, 5.30 Pacific Standard Time. I hope I started on time. If you're watching the replay, welcome. Today, we're going to talk about... Well, let's talk about how you guys can improve and what you need to focus on when it comes to improving because there's so many things for you guys to focus on, right? As a coach, I hear it all day long. I hear it from newer riders, Olympic riders, seasoned veterans, you know, guys that are racing 45, 50 year old cruiser classes. I get texts all the time, I get messages all the time. It's crazy and it's awesome, I love hearing about you guys wanting to improve. And there's so much to improve on, right? Because there's so many different areas to improve. And in this video, I really wanna take the opportunity to dissect the different, well, the different areas, right? Whether it's gonna be racing skills, your physical capacity, your emotional and mental capacity, and of course, your track skills, right? When it comes to improvement, I'm always hearing things like power and gates. And then I hear things about racing strategies. You know, my son leaves the door open or my son, you know, when he's racing with three other riders, he has no problems going 100% to the first jump. But when there's a full gate, he just shuts down. And so there are so many different things that are going on, right? So it's crazy, right? It could be it could be a racing strategy. It could be uh, a lack of uh, behavioral, both uh, emotional and mental capacity. It could be a racing IQ. They just don't know what to do. Or it could just straight up be a track skill capacity, right? They're just, they're just not competent enough to perform the skill on the track. I'll tell you what, guys. You know, I got to give you guys props. We have to give ourselves props when it comes to BMX racing. You know, I've played a lot of different sports. I've played, I've played probably one of the most hardest sports, um, uh, playing ice hockey. And let me tell you, man, there's a lot of things going on in terms of having the physical capacity, having the skill set to skate, the skill set to handle the puck, the skill set to understand the game, the mental and emotional capacity to handle the chirping and the fighting and, and all the BS that happens in a hockey game. BMX racing is pretty darn tough. You guys are really, really vulnerable. You guys are warriors, man. And you guys are fighting for yourselves. There are no teammates. There isn't a band of guys standing behind you ready to take on the world. It's you versus everyone else, right? And so not only that, you also have to battle the track. Right? You have to navigate the track and you need to have the skill set and the competence and the comp and the confidence to navigate the track, right? You have to have the skill set. And if we're not winning, we're learning. And it's hard for you guys to understand that because a lot of people believe that, you know, if you're not winning, then it's failure. And then over here at BMX training, there's no such thing as failure, only feedback. So therefore, do you have that value? Do you have the value of always wanting to learn and if you're not winning, right? Having the behavior flexibility, having the mental and emotional capacity. All right. Let's take a look and see who's joining us live. Again, thank you so much for joining. We have Jean-Philippe. Good evening from Ottawa, Canada. Jackson Langley, how's it going? Darren, hello from Minnesota. 
and Jackson's coming from Georgia. So we got people coming, you know, all over the United States here. Jake Jensen, what's up? Jake was posting in, in on one of the posts I made on on BMX Training YouTube. I, I sometimes post photos on there, and you guys, I ask a question, you guys engage, and I really appreciate that. And you guys know this, and I would say ninety to a high ninety percentage of what am I saying? In the ninety percentile, I'm always answering back uh, in the community of YouTube. I, I love you guys, man. I love this community. It's awesome. Logan with the smiley face. Alana says hello from Arizona. RJ Pabin says hello from Michigan. Wow. Eric Rowe, what's up, coach? Hey, guys, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate this. This this gives me a big energy boost. Uh, and, uh, man, I, I tell you what, I'm, I'm blushing, man. This is great. I, I really, really enjoy uh, presenting live. It's, it's definitely a challenge. And, uh, and at the same time, it's a lot of fun. Um, Damien Como says hi. So if you guys are just joining again, today we're going to be talking about you guys identifying and sorting out what you want to improve on, right? And, and giving more attention on what needs to be addressed at the moment. You know, it's funny. I do a lot of life coaching. I have those skills and I'm very proud of it. And one of the things that I do with my clients is we sort out their life by going over a chart called the Wheel of Life. And I, I took a, a, a pie chart and divided their life up into eight different slices. And I'll give you some examples. So work and career, home environment, relationships, family and friends, fun and recreation, health and fitness, okay, and, you know, spirituality, and what else did I miss? Oh, um, money and finance. And then what I do is I basically ask these guys on a scale of one to 10, where are you at right now in your life in all these areas on a scale of one to 10? One being absolutely down in the dumps in survival mode. 10 being, man, you're just absolutely perfect. You know, five is, you know, you're, you know, in the middle of the road, you're surviving. And so, my point is, I want you guys to take what I'm about to show you guys, take some notes, and, and if you don't have a pen and paper right now, that's okay, you guys can rewatch this. And if you're on the replay, grab a piece of paper and a pen right now. Take some notes and I want you to identify on a scale of one to 10. One being, hey man, you know, you're, you, you just have no competence there. 10 being you're absolutely perfect. And I want you guys to be honest with yourself, whatever number comes, to your mind, first time is going to be more than more than likely the the accurate number that we're going to go with. So, um, why is this important? Well, we want to take a clear and honest look at our complete BMX racing performance, right? Or what I would call our BMX skills. Again, as it pertains to track skills, racing skills, emotional and mental skills. All right. We're going to identify all of these, and I want you guys to take a deep look at these and be honest with yourself and see where you're at. And listen, if you're at an eight and above, that's pretty darn good. You know, most people, you know, when it comes to regular life, you know, people that have uh, a work and career, money and finance, relationships, home environment, we'll just stick with those four, health and, health and fitness, why not? We'll throw that one in as well. If you're operating at an eight and above, man, you're you're truly in the top five percentile of people operating at a high frequency in life. That's pretty darn good. And so if you're operating, say at an eight and above in any area, and you keep hammering home like, oh, I gotta keep improving, I need to be perfect. Listen, what is perfect, you know, perfect, to me might mean perfect differently to you or you know to any of these other guys such as Logan, RJ, Eric, Damian, Jake, any of these guys that are here watching. Josh Bennett says hello. Mr. Wilson, Roscoe H, hello. Every one of us has different internal representations of what's perfect on what's an eight and above. All right, so you know enough of that. We're looking at uh, 540 and uh, I'm going to do my best to 
cruise right through this. And then of course, if you guys have any questions as it pertains to, to this, please leave them in the comments below. You guys know me, I'm gonna answer back, whether it's on the replay or whether it's live. And then of course, at the at, after this little quick presentation, we're gonna do our favorite part, the Ask Coach G section, where you guys get to ask your best BMX racing and training performance questions, and I'll do my best to get to all of them. All right, so shall we? All right, guys, well, here we go. Slide number one. Okay, well, let's look at BMX skills as a whole here, right? So as you can see, I have in blue, which are gonna be the most important, what we're, what we're gonna address today. I don't know if I have the time to go over, well, we, we will go over the physical capacity, but I don't have time to go over the performance team and the training environment. But listen, as an Olympic coach, when I take athletes who are dead serious about going to the Olympic Games and they have the wherewithal to do it, they're already a proven professional, they're already proven to be you know, operating in the top five percentile in their sport and all these other categories, as a coach, I'm looking to squeeze one to 2% gains in every little category because as a coach, it's already hard for me to improve all these areas in, in big leaps, right? These guys are already operating at a high, high performance. So when I look at ones, when I look at an Olympic athletes performance program, pretty much these are the six basic components that we look at. And then of course, you know, we do a drop down menu for each of these and, and we, we comb through each and one of these and we, we do a, a, an honest and uh, very comprehensive dissection of each of these components. So number one, track skills, right? We have track skills, okay? That means your competence of navigating the track. You know, that's gonna include gate starts, that's gonna include manualing, that's gonna include pumping, that's gonna include jumping, right? And when it comes to, you know, supercross racing, hey, you know, especially for these juniors and girls. Are you capable of, ju of jumping a pro section on a supercross track? Man, because that's a lot different than jumping jumps at your local track. That's a whole nother level. We don't need to go there just yet, but I'm just saying. And then you have, you know, can you corner? Can you corner properly? Can you go through a corner, execute the three basic lines of a inside line, a rail line, uh, you know, maybe perhaps an outside line or a high-low line, right? Can you perform all these different lines in a corner with complete competence, having the ability to uh, hold traction, if you will? All right, so track skills, racing skills. Racing skills are going to be your IQ, right? Your vision on the track, your ability to create and make moves, Okay. Are you smart enough to prevent passes? Having position awareness, right? Okay. Emotional mental skills. This this one here, if you guys know me, you guys have been following me on on live here. And anytime you guys see me, you know, whether it's Instagram or posting, man, I'm huge. I'm very much huge on emotional and mental skills because here's the deal. And I've learned this and, and I've been blessed to have the opportunity to work with some of the best athletes in the world in our sport. And really, truly, to be honest with you, the biggest difference always comes down to the emotional and mental skills, right? It always comes down to the mindset. The mindset's gonna be your values and your beliefs. What do you believe? What do you value? Your performance mind state. Do you have the ability to get into your performance mind state access it and sustain it? Do you have the behavior flexibility to get over that bad lap and just keep moving forward? Do you have the behavior flexibility to get over what something said to you? What, what something, where, where someone said something unwarranted to you, right? Where it potentially can affect you in a negative way, which, which could shift you out of state. Do you have the flexibility to just shrug it off and get back into your performance mind state and get back to the task at hand. If you guys play other sports and you guys know that there is a lot of chirping going on in in day-to-day -day sports, basketball, football, baseball, well, I don't know about baseball, hockey. Hockey's are 
man, hockey players are straight thugs. <laughs> they really are. But they're the absolute most genuine gentlemen to each other off the ice. If you guys, some of my, you know, Jean-Philippe, who's who's from Canada, maybe, I don't know if you're a hockey fan, please forgive me if you are or not. I'm not trying to generalize you, but most of you guys are born with, with ice skates on. And so you guys know. And so anyways, do you guys have the emotional and mental skills or the capacity to perform, right? It's the last moto. They're, they're taking one. There's three of you in the gate. Are you going to perform? It's the last moto at the Grands. It's your last opportunity on the last day to qualify. You're in the fourth spot position in a semi to make the main. Do you have the emotional and mental capacity to handle that? All right. So we're not going to go too deep into those, but I'm going to give you some ideas on that. And then I want you guys to go ahead and start uh, writing and grading and scaling I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So basically, you guys are going to give you guys a, you're, you're going to write down a number of how you feel about each one. All right. So let's let's move forward here. Let's go to track skills. And look at that. I created the bullet points for you guys. All right. You, is this is this helpful for you guys? Is this really helpful for you guys? Let me know in the comments below. Drew Polk. What's up, Coach G? Been binge watching all the videos and streams lately. Hey, thank you, my man. Magic Maple, you're in the house. Love that Magic Maple. Uh, Jean Philippe, yeah, we've been wearing skates since he's been wearing ice skates since he was four years old. <laughs> I love it. I have a couple pairs in the garage. I cut my skates at one half inch hollow. All right, so track skills. First and foremost, I think this is really important. It doesn't matter if you're an Olympic athlete, a beginner athlete, a newer athlete a top level expert like Drew here who's joining us, or if you're a struggling expert. Track skills are, are always an area that we can easily scrutinize and see where we can, where we can improve, right? Get those one to 2% marginal gains as we call it. I'm gonna present probably close to 20 different bullet points on, on where you guys can improve. If you guys can improve on 1% on each one of these, Dude, that's like a 20% improvement, and that's absolutely huge. So, number one, track skills. Gates. Is your gate starts? Are your gate is your gate start technique efficient? Is it is it complementary the second and third pedal out of the gate? Is it is it complementary? Is it complementary? Is it complementary to your second and third pedal stroke out of the gate? Are you efficient? Do you have a good gate? Are you getting the most out of your gate? Okay. Where can we improve? Can we improve in the first movement? Can we improve in your acceleration position? All right, we're talking technical. Do we need to lower your pedal? Do we need to raise it? You know, are we getting the front wheel up in the sweet spot so we can beat the gate down? Or are we just letting it, are we just trying to like beat it down at the bottom? What are we doing? Are we doing what it takes to find marginal gains in our start in an effort to make it more efficient, more effective in terms of utilizing and being complementary to the power that we have to give into our pedal stroke coming out of the gate. You know, I, I you know, when when Corbin Chara back in 2016, unfortunately he didn't do too well at, at the World Championships, and so he had to race the Olympic trials. And one of the things as a coach is I, I recognize quickly like man, he's just not popping out of the gate. And so I started working on breaking down his gate start from a beginner level. It's like, how do I coach beginners? I got I to gotta treat him as a beginner. And man, it worked. I got his gate start working so darn well again. In fact, I took the same program and I put it into the store, over, over, store.bmxtraining. If you guys go to bmxtraining.com, there is a course in there called the Gate Start Secrets course. It's a four-week course. It's the exact same coaching that I gave Corbin Sherrod to prepare him to win the Olympic trials. And he's done really well with it. And, and one of the things I was finding was basically he just wasn't, he was really hesitant in getting that first movement moving properly, efficiently, effectively, and there was a lot of hesitation there. So we reconfigured that. And then I started analyzing like, okay, well, where's your, where's your position when you deliver 
when you're ending the, the, the end of the first stroke, getting in the second, look where your butt is. Let's get that a little bit more forward. It's too far back behind the seat. You're wasting energy. His hips were moving all over the place. So, you know, we worked on technique and then we addressed, if, if we couldn't fix it in technique, then we would dress it in the gym in the strength. And we'll, we'll go over the strength part here in a second. But, you know, that's just an example. Let's move forward. Sprinting, you know, are you, are you able to sprint effectively straight up? Okay, that's just being able to sprint fast, be able to pedal between jumps. Are you missing pedal strokes? Can you get more, more pedals on the track? Pumping and manually. I mean, believe it or not, I mean, I could think of some of my juniors and my girls. It's like, guys, it's like you guys are trying to pedal the backside. Why don't we spend more time pumping and generating more, more speed that way, right? Let's work on our pumping more, pumping backsides. This goes for everybody. I don't care if you're a beginner or you're a top Olympic athlete. Listen, pedaling ET all wide open with the wind, you know, getting in our helmet and our chest, Let's get, let's focus on getting low. Let's get that big, big, big pump on the backside of that jump and generate more speed that way. It's consistent every time. Manualing, same thing. When we're, end, when we're ending our manuals, when we're ending our manuals, are we getting at a good pump as well? There's still pumping to be had. Guys, jumps are made to create speed, not lose speed. Okay, jumping. Okay, are we... Are we competent with our techniques of jumping? Are we able to get the floating technique down? Are we able to get the subterranean racer push through technique down? Okay. Are we, are, are we making sure we're getting good backside as well? Cornering. Are we, number one, are we able to turn on flat ground? Okay, because if you could turn on flat ground, sure as heck you could turn on a banked corner. So is our technique good? Are we looking ahead? Are we looking where we need to go? Is our pedal down? Are we able to lean the bike aggressively and ensure that our tires are maintaining traction? Okay, so those are our track skills. Let's keep moving forward, guys. Shall we? Where should, where should we go from here? Let's go to racing skills. Racing skills and IQ. Position and awareness, right? Position and awareness. I was talking to a client earlier today and he was having a trouble, he was having trouble moving over on a rider. I have a lot, I have a lot of clients that have a, that have trouble moving over. They just don't move over aggressive enough. These young kids who have fathers that say, hey, you know what? Just move over like a Mercedes Benz windshield wiper, wham. I mean, they're just putting people out before the 30 foot mark. Listen, I don't want you to do that, but I don't want you to race maliciously. However, I do definitely want you to shut the door down, okay, going into that first corner. You, if you give them an inch, they're going to take a foot. So do you have that position awareness? Do you have a target when you're in the gate? Do you know where you want to go? Okay. Passing abilities, right? Do we have our inside move down? Do we have uh, the X pass down? Do we have the high low down just in case we need just because just in case we hit the gate or slip a pedal or slip a pedal? <laughs> That's pretty good. If you clip out, right? But <laughs> oh, please forgive me. That made me laugh because there's a picture over here of me. I'm, I, I have a I'm, there's a picture I see of myself on the wall over here and I'm wearing flat pedals with some GT He-Mans. Anyways, um, yeah, I used to slip pedals all the time. But do you have those lines down? Right? Or do you have, are you training? Are you, are you training the strategy to make passes? Right? And you guys should be doing that every practice. You guys, younger guys should always be practicing with older guys and trying to make moves on them in the first turn. Okay. Do you have the ability to have vi vision on the track? Can you see the track clearly? Or are you just caught up on, oh my gosh, I got to make sure I get through this rhythm section. I don't bonk or crash. Okay. Because if you could eliminate that, if you could get to a point where you don't have to think about riding or negotiating the track, navigating the track, right? You get to a level of your track skills, right? Where you get to a level where your track skills have complete mastery 
that unconscious competence where you're doing something without thinking, then really truly that's going to open up your vision and that's going to give you the ability to create and create the results that you want, right? It's awesome when you're like third place and you can create that vision and have that vision and know who you're racing and know where to go and, and create all this awesome speed and momentum and execute that pass and pass two dudes and raise your hands up at the finish line, crossing the line first. It's awesome when you have that. Again, it goes back to your track skills. You want to you want to reach a level of an eight and above unconscious competence. Probably should have went over the levels of learning, but that's no, okay. All right, let's keep moving forward because I definitely want to. I mean, the live the live feed is just it's awesome today. <laughs> Christopher Johnson says tunnel vision. <laughs> Damien Como, what's the best position on the bike to be anywhere on the track? What's the best position on the bike? Yeah, we'll get to that. I don't give me more context. All right, you guys are getting me excited over here. I see this this thing just just filling up with comments. Keep them coming though, please. Let's go to the next one. Um, let's see here, physical capacity. All right, physical capacity here. Do you guys have adequate power? BMX is a sprinting sport, straight up. Can you guys overcome? your body weight and your bike weight overcome the inertia out of the gate and be competitive. Do you have the power to do that? Do you guys have the adequate strength and speed? Do you, Cause strength and speed is pretty much power, but are you guys working on your strength and speed? Are you guys increasing your strength? Cause strength is the limiting force when it comes to power. Are you guys working on your speed work? Are you guys working on rate of force development? I'm looking forward to putting out a video. I've been working on it for about a week. I think I'll release it on Thursday. Let me know if you guys, I'm doing this live show on Monday and I'm, I'm also dedicated to loading, uploading another video in the middle of the week. Which day do you guys want? Is it Wednesday or Thursday? You guys let me know. And in this new video we're working on, it's, it's basically going to go over my three favorite exercises to improve acceleration power in the gym. So are you guys working on strength? Are you guys working on speed? Are you guys working on rate of force development? Muscular endurance. Are you guys work? Are you guys doing the work that it takes to remove metabolic waste from the first turn all the way to the finish line? Are you guys improving your power from the first turn all the way to the finish line as it pertains to a full lap? Okay, that's muscular endurance. Are you guys doing broken sprints? Are you guys working on half lap work, three quarter lap work, intervals, right? All with short recovery. Are you guys working on that muscular endurance? That's really, really important. It's something that's easily overlooked. Recovery. Now, recovery is kind of weird. Recovery, are you, is your, are you in shape enough to recover fast? Are you getting good sleep? Are you getting good nutrition? And then also recovery can be looked at as, hey, are you re are you recovering between race lap to race lap? Or are you feeling fatigued at the end of the day when it counts most? When the semis are coming up, are you sleepy? Are you tired? Can you not wake up? Okay. Do we need to, do we need to improve your fitness there? All right. Because you could race all day really well, but no one really remembers, especially, listen, everyone always remembers the last lap of the day. <laughs> okay, that's the most important one. Gary Ellis told me, you know, back in the day when we used to race three main events, if he had a if he started out the first two mains really bad, he would save face and go for the win of the third main event and he told me, "Hey Greg, they always remember who wins the last race." <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Okay, great. Let's go to my favorite one shall we? And perhaps I, I want to get you guys to a level of competence where m your mental, emotional capacity matters most. Okay. Because really, at, truly at the end of the day, it's really all about, it's really all about why you guys do it, your purpose, your goals, your intent. And I have that written here. And then of course there's performance mind state. So let's start from the top. All right. Your mindset. Now your mindset is your values and your and your beliefs. 
You know, your values are, well, your values are, hey, what do you do it for? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to prove? Are you doing it for fun? Are you trying to prove it, prove to someone else or something else? You know, because you're not good enough. I don't know. Do you have the beliefs? Do you have the beliefs to pull off the goals that you want? What limiting beliefs that you have? Are you working on, on, on ridding of those and replacing them with awesome limitless ones? Okay. Mindset's a big one. It's, it's pretty much, it's pretty much our programming of the subconscious mind. Let me give you an example. So this is my favorite one that I use in life coaching. And it's all about having the capacity, the programming to become who you want to be. And uh, I might get off track here for a second. But when I think of lottery winners, when we think of people that win the lottery and they win millions of dollars, there are studies that indicate in the high 90 percentile that these guys actually go broke after a year. And 100% of them always say, I wish it didn't happen to me. So what happens is they win millions of dollars. They go out, they quit their job. Their family and friends are probably hitting them up for money. They're spending money like it's out of control. And then it's not sustainable because they have all this, all this debt, all these bills. And what happens is they end up losing it all. And the bottom line is they've ran into what is called an upper limit thermostat problem. An upper limit thermostat problem is basically your subconscious mind saying, dude, you're getting too hot here. You're too rich. We're not that rich. This is where we're at. We're down here. Okay. So it's, so when you get hot, your upper limit thermostat brings you back down. This happens to most of us in pretty much all areas of life. So if you could recognize that upper limit thermostat problem and rid or reprogram it, then you can have awesome, you can have awesome success and results in anything you want. So, so basically when it comes to these guys that win the lottery, they just don't have the programming to be a millionaire. They don't have the programming to be abundant. They were raised potentially in a household where money grew on trees. There's not enough money, right? Money's a struggle. Money's the root of all evil. They hear all these limiting beliefs. So that kind of falls in the mindset. Do you have the mindset to be a winner? Do you have the mindset to, to keep on improving? Or are you in another mindset where it's just like you're always looking for what's wrong and you're always looking for reasons why you can't improve or you're looking for reasons why you can't be great, okay? Okay. Those are all mindset things. Those are all subconscious programs that you guys can easily change if you work on it. And if you let me, I can help you. All right, enough on that. <laughs> That's pretty deep. Uh, goals and intent. This is a big one. What are your goals? And when I say goals, I don't mean, well, I just want to get faster. Man, you guys got to get clear. It's kind of like when you guys go to a restaurant and, and you sit down and a waiter comes up to you. You don't just say, hey, I'm hungry. I want food. No. I'm going to be direct with my order. Okay, if I'm if I'm going to go to a restaurant and it's it's breakfast time, I want uh, I want a short stack of pancakes, gluten free, uh, vegan butter, sugarless syrup, whatever. I'm just I'm just saying, right? Two eggs scrambled. I don't want them runny. I don't want them overcooked. Be direct, right? What is it that you guys want in terms of your of your performance goals when it comes to BMX racing? If you guys just say, oh, I just want to get to, I was working with a kid earlier. Uh, I want to get first or I want to get top three. Well, which one is it, man? Because, you know, <laughs> that's like asking the waiter, well, you know, I want the special one, two, three, and four. Dude, you're not going to be able to have it all. You can't have it all. Pick one dish. Is it first? Go for the first. Okay. What do you have to lose? You're, you're, if you don't win, you're only going to, you're only going to learn. You're going to get feedback. Always go for the best. But I would say that your goals need to be performance driven. So most of my clients in the winter circle program, we always set out a performance goal, a year end goal. So it would be like, you know, national age group number one. I want to be a top 10 nag rider. Great. Well, which number do you want? <laughs> okay. All right. So we got to get specific with our goals. Intent. The intent is everything, man. Like, it's huge. You know, 
you know, in, in racing a long time, especially like 15 years of pro, but, but even before that, like from the age of eight years old till I was 20, what was that? 12 years of racing amateur, 15 years of racing pro, a couple years of vet pro tacked on the back of that. I would say my intent, it, it changed, it fluctuated quite a bit, especially when I was young. You know, when, when, it's hilarious, right? Like, it's crazy the mindset of, of us racers on why we do things. I would say one season, I was on a revenge season. Uh, you know, when I, my second year of pro, I, I didn't have I didn't have a good year. So, you know, there was another racer that was coming up and there was rumors that my sponsor, GT, wanted to sponsor this other hot rookie kid who was winning, who was doing really well. So my intent changed. I was kind of moving from a negative motivator, but I was like, my intent was I need to train because I don't want to lose my sponsor, but it it sparked and lit, lit a fire underneath my butt and got me going, got me moving. I created movement and I started focusing on, on good results and started doing the hard work to get that. But the intent was weird because it was like I was in a survival mode. I needed to prove to my sponsor that I was worthy. But then, you know, then I would go and win everything. <laughs> I would win the fall nationals, win the grand nationals, triple out the grands. And it's like, okay, well now what? My, my, my intent needs to upgrade. It needs to keep going and spiraling up. So what's my intent from there? Okay, well, let's go after a national number one pro title. All right, let's go for a pro world championship. The intent needs to keep rising up. As a kid, that's, it's really weird. I, you know, I would say that it was like, at, at the local level, it was like, I, my intent was just to get recognized to get a sponsor, right? That was my intent. You know, sometimes it was like, you know, hey, you know, maybe at the age of 14, I had this girlfriend, I wanted to impress her. So I wanted to show her that I was a winner. Kind of a weird intent, but still it was an intent. And you want to question these intents. Are these intents purposeful? Are they meaningful? Is it contextualized, right? Is it good for you? Good for your family? Good for your family, friends, and your community? Okay, that's that's going really, you know, it's going really abstract there. But I would say that you need to you need to contextualize your goals. Are they good for you, good for others? That's important, okay? I think that's really important there. Because if it's only just for you, sometimes there's just not enough ambition, right? That that ambition to get us out of bed, to get us motivated. So you need to have a purpose. It's kind of like when I wake up and do BMX Coach Live. This isn't all for me. This is for you guys, okay? This is for our sport. This is for me, you, my family, and the community of BMX, it's meaningful. That's why I show up every Monday and I'm recommitting every Monday to you guys, okay? So intense everything. All right, let's keep moving forward here. Your performance mind state. Are you guys able to access and sustain a performance mind state that enables you to have your best performance consistently every time? Think about that. Are you guys getting into the gate, being focused, empowered, confident, strong, feeling good, looking good, whatever, right? That's your performance mind state. Or are you coming in in an unresourceful mind state? Are you nervous? Are you scared? Do you have fear of falling, fear of crashing, fear of failure? All right, so you guys got to sort that out. On a scale of one to 10, where are you guys at with your performance mind state? Where are you guys at with your goals and intent? Where are you guys at with your mindset? This stuff is huge, man. Let me tell you, because if I didn't have any of this stuff, I wouldn't be here right now talking about BMX. I would be doing something else. I don't know. I mean, this kind of stuff here will give you sustainability, not only in racing BMX, but in life. This is all about life, man. We're don't you you guys are only doing BMX. You guys don't know this, but the things that you accomplish in BMX are helping you spiral up to become something bigger than that. You guys are more than BMX. You guys are bigger than BMX. And I just want to I just really truly want to remind you guys of that. That's the that's the beauty of sport is that when we create these goals it puts us in check. Who do I need to become in an effort to, to achieve that goal? If I want to be an Olympian, you know, let's, if I want to be an Olympic gold medalist, let's look at some Olympic gold medalists. Mara Strombers, Connor Fields, Miriam Pahone, Mariana Pahone, please forgive me. 
What are some of the character traits that they have? That's spiraling them up. What kind of frequency are they operating at in terms of, of success? Who did they have to become in an effort to win at that level? Okay. Last one here, behavior flexibility. This is a huge one. This is something that I wish I had when I was 23, throwing my bike at somebody and getting suspended. I didn't have the behavior flexibility. Someone put me over the turn, triggered me. I had some anger issues, evidently. And yeah, I got, I got shifted out of state, ran over to the next straight and threw my bike at the guy that put me over the turn. I don't know. I mean, sh shift happens. People get shifted out of state. Do you have the behavior flexibility to adapt and overcome? Okay, that's the secret, having behavior flexibility. The law of requisite variety, the person with the most control controls the circumstances. All right. Whew. All right. Well, that was a big one, guys. Let's go back up to the top here and uh, yeah, let's discuss. 6.11, I, 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 took up, I took up like 40 minutes on that. But I think that was a big one. I think this is really important for you guys. And, you know, these skills, when, you know, you guys have to be honest with yourselves. And again, a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being awesome, 1, hey, you're very incompetent and you need to address and start working on things. You know, because I think we, we tend to look at racing improvements linear, right? Like we get in the gate and it's like, okay, well, I'm not getting a good gate. If I don't get a good gate, then I'm off the back. And while that's true, there's other areas that you guys can improve on immediately. Maybe you're not getting a good gate because you don't have the goals to get, to get a good gate. You don't have the intent. Maybe you're shifted out of state, right? Or maybe you're nervous about falling so you don't get a good gait, right? Or maybe you get a good gait, you get out front and you start to race timid because you're scared of crashing over a jump. You guys don't have, you, you may not have the competence or the confidence to navigate through a rhythm section or a jump. So there's, there's more to it. Again, we tend to look at things linear, right? Oh, I need power. I need, you know, I mean, shoot. I mean, please forgive me. I, I I did create a DVD called Faster First Straight. I get it. I mean, that is probably racing is, you know, 75% of races are won by the whole shot for sure. And many can argue that number, but it's, it's definitely a high percentage. I get that. But if we can improve in other areas, it's going to, it's going to free and liberate ourselves to, to get the whole shot. There's more to it. I had a kid, I had a kid back in 2008, no, 2007, going into the 2008 Olympic Games the first time, and kid was awesome, professional, super efficient, effective gate start, could smash the first two, three pedals, but his problem was, if he wasn't first to the first jump, he would shut it down, he had a, he had a belief, he had a mindset. He had a belief that if he wasn't winning by the first jump, it was over. He didn't bother working on track speed, track skills, his race IQ, his vision to move up, to make passes, to create. All those things, man. All those things. Man, if he would have had those things, I'll tell you what, that guy, would, he would have made the Olympic team and he can get any color medal that he wants. But it's crazy how a limiting belief could, 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 could squash all that talent that he was holding on to. All right, guys. Well, hey, I tell you what. Um, I want you guys to think about this stuff. I honestly, I drink so much water. And, you know, I want you guys to think about this. I want you guys to think about this. Ask me some questions. Let me know what's on your mind as it pertains to figuring out your personal BMX skills program. What is it that you guys need help on? What's an area that you feel that you're ranking a five and below that you guys could start addressing now? Because I tend to look at this. I mean, we look at these skills. Hang on, let me take this book. I see that. Let me let me switch up. 
let me take this book here and let me hold it up with with four fingers all right good book think and grow rich i read the whole thing covid 300 and 376 pages anyways when i when when we go over these things like track skills okay that that's a you know look at this as a table here is a leg on the table that's track skills here's racing skills my thumb is physical capacity maybe my pinky over here is mental emotional capacity we want to harmonize this right if we're leaning like this okay we're heavily on racing skills but don't have the mental emotional capacity and you have weak values and beliefs you might have the you know then you're not going to get anywhere you're not going to get past the first jump you're not even get out of the gate so if we can improve that and it harmonizes us this is what we're always looking for so that's my whole point of this exercise is that anything that's a five and below okay we need to bring it back up because if we bring it back up we're gonna we're gonna raise our frequency we're gonna raise our ability to perform i hope that makes sense let's not be so let's not have the tunnel vision like this guy said here of oh my gosh i need i need power out of the gate i need second third pedal and, and please forgive me I, I i do talk about the second third pedal and it might be clickbait from time to time but i get it i mean everyone wants a great second pedal out of the gate and that's obvious but there's lots of areas where we can improve on to where we can we, we can become the complete racer you know there was a guy by the name of john purse okay who i used to race and in my hum, in my opinion i don't mean to criticize the guy the guy has he has an awesome an awesome resume he's won everything he's won everything there is to win as a, as a pro racer but dang, he, he was not the best. He didn't have the best gate start. He was not the fastest out of the gate. He didn't have the best skills. But this guy had the most heart. He had values and beliefs. And I would say from time to time he had, he had behavior flexibility. Not, not, you know, he did get in fights with, with people on the track. People would take, you know, I'm not going to get into that. But, but my point is this guy... He had so much belief. He had so much invested in his ability to create goals, have the intent, have the mental capacity, the programming to be a champion. Once you have that programming to be a champion, everything else lines up for you. All right, so think about that. All right, so I'm going to go to the restroom real quick. I'll be back in the break. If there's a blank screen, please forgive me. I'll be back in less than a minute. Hey, guys, I have a question. What would it do for you if you could enhance your power out of the gate, enhance your sprint speed down the first straight, enhance your skills, enhance your mental performance mind state? What would that do for your racing or your kids racing? If you're seeing the value of enhancing your BMX performance, consider joining the community of BMX Training Pro and get the same access my Olympic athletes have enjoyed, as well as thousands of BMXers all over the world. Some members use the access to improve their gate start techniques. Some also use the access to keep them motivated to train. And you'll find your reason when you gain access and join BMX Training Pro today. guys welcome back had to go to the bathroom real quick um man i appreciate you guys for sticking around um let's take a look at the feed and see what's going on over here there's so many comments it's crazy well before we go to the comments i just want to make sure did you guys find that last segment helpful leave me a comment below and if you guys are finding any value in this if you guys are finding any value let me know Make sure you like the video and subscribe, okay? 
Let's see here. What do we got for questions? All right. Ask Coach G. Oh, Alana, Brooklyn say yes. Camden says yes. Thank you so much for the feedback because sometimes it's like it's not in real time, but Jackson's, Jackson Langley says love it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that because, man, sometimes I get on a rant and I don't know what's going on and it's good to get the feedback. Camden Funk says, could you do a video on what exercise to do during strength training? <laughs> Squats. Maybe, maybe you can Google it. You're, you're already here on YouTube. Squats. However, um, I will be doing, I'm going to be releasing either Wednesday or Thursday. You guys let me know. I'm going to be releasing a video on improving rate of force development, which is pretty much specific power uh, as it pertains to acceleration power out of the gate. And you guys will definitely get some good ideas there. Um, let's see here. Let's get an awesome question. Let's, let's see. I'm looking for a long one here. TJ Gaddis. Let's see if this one's any good. Okay. TJ Gaddis says, how do you figure out what to manual or jump? I can manual everything on the track, but can't figure out what's the fastest. That's a great question, TJ. And even as a professional, I would I would definitely uh, scrutinize myself on a jump going in the first turn, for example, or even the first jump. In, in pro racing, everything's so tight. It's like, okay, well, how am I going to take the first jump? Because I want to be able to take it to where it's the fastest, but more importantly, it's, it's something that I can execute 100% with confidence consistently every time. Because you could take a fast line, but you, if, you, if you're only executing it 50% of the time, then you got to go to what's 100%. So first and foremost... What can you do consistently 100% of the time? That's going to be the most reliable. And when you have that in your mind and you're confident that you're, re that you're reliable on it, then you're going to be able to attack it even faster. Now, there's a guy that I used to race. He was awesome as a racer, Steve Veltman. He was a freak. 6'2", 200 pounds. He could speed jump a house. He could pull up for a house. He could yank big doubles. And it was fast when he can do it. The rest of the competition, they couldn't do it. They just didn't have the wherewithal to perform a pickup manual like he did. And when he could pull it off, it would give him an extra half a bike length over the competition every time. And that was something I did as a professional. It was like, okay, if, if it's a step jump or a double, is it going to be faster jumping? No. Manually, great. Do I pick up manual? Do I pick up manual and pedal across it? What can I do consistently? How can I create separation with you know versus the other racers? This guy, Steve, he would do the same thing. And when he picked up for something, man, I mean, he just blew the blew the doors right off of people, man. It was crazy. The problem was, like, there's a, there's an old video, the ABA Grands from 19, oh, please forgive me, 19, no, 1990. 1990 ABA Grands, if you guys YouTube search that, there was three main events. And Steve was the fastest, man, by, by far. Another guy, Billy Griggs, was really fast too. And Steve would try to pick up manual this step jump on the first jump unnecessarily every time. He was already first there and he would just, he would overcomplicate it. He was a rookie pro, but man, he was such a freak. And he would overcomplicate it by picking up for it. And he'd bonk it every time and make people crash. Check it out. They, they did restarts everything. I think it was 1990, 1990 or 1991. Yeah. So hope that answers your question. All right. Let's go to a physical question coming in from Kiwi John. Good day from New Zealand, Greg. Hey, good day, mate. I think it's probably morning time over there. So welcome to the show. And not only is it morning time, but you guys are morning time a day ahead of us. You guys are living in the future and I'm over here living in the past. I'm kidding. Uh, Kiwi John says, I'm 55 years old, six foot, 200 pounds. I hit the gym twice a week, but off the bike a year. Okay, I don't know what that means. What do you think is a good way to get my overall BMX fitness on the way up, John? Okay, so you've been consistent with hitting the gym twice a week, but you've been off the bike for the year. Uh, what do you think is a good way to get my overall BMX fitness on the way up? Definitely skills. You know, I, I would focus on Here's the thing, where you're at, especially at 55, the older we get, I appreciate you going to the gym because it's really, really beneficial for us to work on our strength training. There's so many different benefits, right? So from a neurological standpoint, from um, 
bone density, preventing osteoporosis, blah, blah, blah. I think when it comes to us getting, getting our BMX fitness back, I think it comes down to just working on simple skills, okay? Simple manualing, simple pumping, and that's it. Work on those skills and make sure you're smooth. And then another skill that you can work on, perhaps away from the track, is some kind of interval, something that addresses muscular endurance. Because if our skills are not sharpened and we get fatigued, then that tends to put us in a position of compromise where we're going to get squirrely and crash. All right. So work on your skills. I wouldn't go too crazy in terms of like trying to link up entire laps. I would just pick one or two jumps and just go deep into the skill of manualing and pumping. And then, and then away from the track, I would work on our work on muscular endurance, work on intervals. So you, you have the ability to remove metabolic waste. So Therefore, when you are starting to go a little bit longer on the track, doing longer efforts, say from the first jump to the second turn, or you're working on an effort from the first turn to the last turn, and you're going through, you know, a straight of jumps and a rhythm section that you have the capacity to where you're not getting tired, right? You're working on your fatigue ability. Thank you, Kiwi John. I hope that helps. Let's see, I, could, I have the capacity to take on a couple more questions because it is already, um, we're almost an hour and that's about the capacity I have to talk. All right, it's a lot of talking. Um, I really appreciate you guys. So you guys are giving me a lot of, uh, a lot of energy here with all this interaction. So I, I'm grateful for that. Caden Hester, welcome to the show, Caden. Caden asks, or he's commenting, I just moved up to intermediate and grands are in a month. So please tell me what do, what to do to get me ready physically and mentally. Oh man, that's easy. Go sign up for my, my five week grands preparation plan over at bmxtraining.com. Click on the store and click on training plans. There is a five week plan. I'm going to customize it for you. But no, in all reality, I think when it comes to the grands, I would watch the video. Maybe I'll put a card up here uh, on, prep on preparing for the grands. I don't know if it's your first time, Caden, but you definitely want to watch the grands uh, video that I uploaded on this channel. Uh, I don't know what it's called. I don't have it right off the top of my head. And then I would say, Caden, you know, one of the things that you want to work on when it comes to the grands is definitely your muscular endurance, your ability to pedal the entire track without getting tired. Historically in Tulsa, those tracks are really long. They're technical. Some of the jumps are, are deep. The rhythm section's really, really long. If any of you guys have been there, you know the second straight's going to be at least 200, 200, 300 foot long. And it's just going to be filled with jumps and it's going to tire you out. So you have to be able to have the muscular endurance to ensure that you're not getting fatigued because that's what's going to happen. Work on your skills. Uh, as far as your mental capacity, I would work on having the vision of what you want, okay? Be intent with your goals, be specific with your goals, and make sure that it's a positive motivator and not a negative motivator, which is a move away. Make sure that it's a positive motivator, meaning you're moving towards. So what's your goal? Well, I want to make the main, right? As opposed to, well, I don't want to get motoed. See how that sounds? The unconscious mind doesn't understand... Um, it doesn't understand negatives, so it's going to focus on getting motoed. So make sure that you 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 pretty much have that goal configured properly in terms of is it a positive motivator, negative motivator. Make sure it's moving towards the positive. Okay, hope that's helpful. Uh, lots of lots of comments in here. D Danita Reader says, what should be your next goal after winning a state championship? Winning next year's state championship. Maybe perhaps going to a national and winning a national or making a final at the national or getting a podium at the national. Yeah, I, I you know, as a young kid, I do recall winning like a state championship, but I wasn't necessarily a national caliber rider, but I was definitely spiraling up to become one. And so... We would, my father start taking, started taking me to nationals and I would, I would start making finals no problem. And then I would find myself getting fourths and thirds and seconds. And, you know, uh, 
It was all it was all about breaking through and winning that next race, winning that first national. And you know, here's the thing, and this is one of the things I do with my winner circle clients is that we actually reprogram our subconscious mind and teach it as it has already as if it already had won the race, right? Like I have a client who she's not on here, but she's she's doing really well. And uh, we created a goal of her getting a national age group number one title. She's never done it before. And I, I talk to her every other week and we meet up and during our coaching sessions, I'm like, okay, well, we're, we're out with the goal. And she's like, I'm winning it. And I can tell she's completely 100% congruent with it because she has the programming. The subconscious mind is programmed. She plays a visual movie every day of what it's gonna be like as if she already accomplished the goal of winning the Grand Nationals and winning the National Age Group number one plate. So you have to have that vision. You have to create that movie. You have to play that movie. You have to elicit the submodalities of what it's gonna feel like, uh, what you're gonna see, what you're gonna hear, what you're gonna feel as if you already accomplished the goal. I'm kind of running on a tangent here, but Danita, please forgive me. I, I think at the end of the day, you definitely wanna keep spiraling up your goals. You, can't, you It's kind of like, hey, you know what? You made $100,000 this year. Well, what's the next goal? All right, well, let's let's increase it by 5%. Let's increase it by 10%. And it's crazy when, when it comes to creating goals. You know, I was taught, and it's kind of funny, and this really pertains to like money and finance goals. Like if we're, if we're getting close to like 95%, we have to start creating a new goal because the unconscious mind already believes it already achieved it. So we have to we have to create new goals. And so... I appreciate that. If you already won the state championship, then you know let's let's win the regional, let's win the gold cup, let's win the national, or you know, sure, let's go for the national. You know, let's get some feedback, see where we're at. Hope that's helpful. You always want to keep spiraling up. Alana, there's a comment. She says here, uh, "What do you?" Tell yourself mentally before a race, I feel like I tell myself that I don't have the physical ability anymore after taking a break from a broken bone, trying to keep up with the other older kids. So this is what I do, Alana, as a coach, and I'm your coach because you're here and I'm talking to you. And you guys here on the live stream and on the replay, I'm your coach. I'm here for you guys. So I appreciate you guys. And I'm going to give you help with that, Alana. First and foremost, we got to get clear, Alana, on what you want to accomplish. Okay. What's your goal? What's the intent of the goal? Okay. Number one. Number two, what resources do you have that will enable you to believe that you will achieve this goal? Elicit everything and anything. It could be something as silly as I have a bike. I have a track. I have a, I have a helmet. I have people that support me. You have to start rebuilding your confidence, Alana. Okay. And it starts with the most fundamental things. And then you can go ahead and identify what is it that you need? What resources do you need in an effort to achieve the goal that you want? List those. But I tell you what, you, you're, you're definitely doing yourself a disservice by going to the race and saying, I feel like I tell myself, you're telling yourself that I don't have the physical ability anymore then you know what? Whatever you say is one is, ex, is exactly 100% true to you. So maybe you say, you know what? I can ride. I do have skills. I can get a gait. You have to change your self-talk and move it towards a positive motivator. Move it in a direction towards success. All right. Hope that's helpful. And she's, Alana says, has one more comment here. She says, Seems to be a struggle for me knowing they have a higher skill level. Well, here's the thing. There's always going to be someone that has a higher skill level. There's always going to be someone that's that's coming up into your class or someone that you haven't raised that has a higher skill level. I just gave you the chart of this. Track skills, racing skills, emotional, mental skills. You know, maybe perhaps it's it's something in the physical capacity. You know, maybe you can work on it there. Maybe you can work on it right here. 
your mental emotional capacity there's so many other areas that you guys can improve on your track skills look at that i just gave you like 15 i just gave you guys 15 different areas that you can improve on so i would say alana don't get caught up in the one area that you feel like you're inadequate and and compare yourself to yourself there's no need to compare yourself to others. Compare yourself to yourself, okay? All right, we're, you know, I'll go for another five minutes. Let's see what other what other questions we have. We have gearing questions. We have uh, training, uh, help for creating a training schedule for over the winter. Jake Jensen, my man. All right, I'll help out Jake here. Let's coach him real quick. Jake ask any help for Sure, I'm reading this right. Jake Jensen asked, any help for creating a training schedule over the winter? Yeah, man, what is it that you want to improve on? <laughs> Everyone's winter is different, right? If you're in Australia or you're like Kiwi John, they're actually experiencing summer. <laughs> if you're on the West Coast over here in San Diego, our winter time, we could ride a track year long. If you're in Canada, like Jean-Philippe here, you're locked up, man. You can't get outside. The door's frozen. So what does, what does winter training mean to you? What resources do you have? Do you have the ability to ride a track? Okay, if that's not, that's not off the table, then do you have access to a gym? You don't have that. Do you have access to a bike and an indoor trainer? What resources do you have? What does winter training mean to you? How much winter training do you have? Do you have all the resources? What is it that you're looking to improve on? There's so much, man. It's so crazy, right? But I would say at the end of the day, doing not knowing what is exactly that you need, generally speaking, winter training is an opportunity to work on your muscular endurance, work on strength, right? Because we're always working on power. We're always doing sprints. We're always doing gates. We're always doing explosive movements. And we know that the limiting factor to power is strength. So this is a great opportunity to increase your strength, whether it would be specifically on the bike or in the gym. Maybe strength means to you improving your muscular endurance on the track, improving your anaerobic capacity. Maybe maybe it means, you know what? I'm ha you, maybe you're having a hard time getting through a, a full national race day and you're feeling tired towards the end of the race day. So maybe it's a great opportunity to work on your aerobic engine just so that you have a little, you have a bigger matchbook to play with. This is kind of a term in cycling, but it's one thing if you have speed. And when we do efforts, we're burning matches every time. The person with the big matchbook has the ability to be more aggressive in the race. Okay, and I'm, I'm talking about like road cycling. But same thing, the same thing applies in BMX. We, we definitely want to improve our, our volume of work, make our matchbook bigger. That way, when we go out and race a national, which may can, you know, if you, if you race two bikes, you race, you know, quarter, semi, the main events, two days in a row. I mean, I want to make sure that every time you get on the gate, you're able to burn, you, you, have, a, you have enough matches for each of those efforts, but you're burning big matches. Bam, bam, bam. Okay, so winter time is a great time for you to increase your strength and increase the volume of work, generally speaking. I hope that's helpful. Jake, thank you very much for the question. Kiwi John says, uh, I forgot about intervals. Yeah, man. Uh, Drew Polk. Drew Polk. Thank you for joining the show and, and uh, thank you so much for contributing. I really appreciate you, Drew. Drew asked, or maybe as a comment, let me read it. If you're drag racing down the first straight and you're on the outside, is it better to go around the outside and try to lean down or tag up and go more inside? Just had an incident like this. Yeah, that, that, that's Drew. That's a great question, man. And, and you know what? It, it really depends on a lot of things. I've, I've done both, right? I think the natural tendency for us racers, especially a, a national caliber rider, 
you know, Drew's a, Drew's a national age group number one champion. And for him to ask a question here is, is awesome. It's very, I'm, I'm humbled and honored. And, and, and I would say that you're humbled to ask the question. Now going, f I would say the natural tendency of course is like full gas, full on pedaling as hard as we can, go deep as we can with our speed and power through the first straight, deep into the first turn. That's naturally what we do. But sometimes when we do that and someone else is just a tad bit faster, we're stuck on the outside. And when you're stuck on the outside and, and the turn goes like this, it's like, oh man, you just lost 10 feet. So let me just give you, let me just give you a general answer on this one, Drew. I would say option A. Yes, go deep as you can and get your get your handlebar, get your shoulder, get your elbow as close to the guy that's in front of you if you didn't hold shot. And communicate with the guy. Move, turn, hurry up. I mean, you know, ask Gary else, ask any pro. That, well, I don't know if you're going to have that ability to ask these guys. I mean, they're, they're retired and long gone from the sport. But I used to communicate on the track. <laughs> I would tell people what to do. <laughs> Sometimes you have to, man. You got to train these guys. <laughs> you got to program to to know what what you want and so move over okay so that's 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 game plan number one and sometimes i get it it doesn't always work out because you're stuck on the outside and two dudes on two dudes that are a bike or two behind you all they have to do is just take a, an inside default line and they're already by default in front of you as, as soon as the turn happens and that's frustrating i get it Option B, you said tag up. So that means letting some wheels go, okay? Letting some wheels go so you could get underneath and pass. There's a guy named Andres Jimenez. He got fourth at the 2008 Olympic Games. Maybe perhaps you can Google that. I think like in the semis and whatnot, he was doing that, right? He was purposely letting... Off, he was purposely raising his foot off, lifting his foot off the gas pedal. All right. That way he could get over to the inside and start making some moves. And it was crazy, man. He was just like, you know what? I just wasn't fast enough, man. This is my best tactic. And he stuck with it. Fourth place or better, right? That's BMX and, and it enabled him to get into the main event. And then ironically, he was able to get fourth place at the Olympic Games one spot away from a medal. That was his tactic. It was hilarious. You could do that. It depends on the track. It depends on how big the turn is. It, will it will it will it lend to an awesome X pass or a high low move? Back in the day when I raced, 1998 West Palm Beach, short first straight, really steep starting hill, big steep, a tall step jump, not a big jump, but it's, but tall. And then right after that, there was like a speed jump, and then boom. Left hand turn. The, the straightaway couldn't have been longer than a hundred. No, I'm exaggerating. Maybe it was like a two hundred feet, maybe less than two hundred feet, one hundred fifty feet. And if you were stuck on the outside, hold. You know, you could be second place. Three dudes will get in underneath you. So what I would do is I actually I would check up or tag up or let up, like you say, and then I would I would start looking ahead, wait for the watch all the tr watch all for the watch all watch all the tires clear my front tire and then i would just dive underneath aggressively and i remember i went from eighth to third and then i was in a position to, to pick off the other two guys in front of me and it worked out well it was a good strategy so it depends on it depends on a couple things is the first turn paved because if the first turn's paved then you could be real aggressive with different lines if it's dirt if the, or if it's like some of the some of the Tulsa tracks in the past have been dirt and really long and drawn out, so there really is no opportunity for an effective high low. You come out on the low, but everyone on the high is coming down with more momentum because that turns like a big NASCAR first turn, if you will, and people are just pedaling the heck out of it, and they're coming out with more speed. And meanwhile, you're down here on the low, and you're not coming out with mo momentum. So you you have to you have to consider the turn. Right? Is it a sharp, steep bank? Is it paved? That's really helpful. Right? If it's a long, drawn-out dirt turn, might not be a good opportunity. You might want to pedal as deep as you can, get on the hip of the guy in front of you, and just yell at him to pedal his butt off. <laughs> All right, guys, this is great. Awesome stuff. 
Anthony Grasher showed up. Aaron Greenreich showed up. Thank you so much. Emmy Dell, Ellie, Damian Como, Joe Gallo, Kiwi John, Jake Jensen, The Russian Potato, Craig Martin, Jenny Strife says you rock. Anxiety, she had a bad one. This was very helpful. Um, guys, there's so many questions in here. I don't know if I have enough time to get to them all. I, I, I would love to get to them all. And uh, yeah, Drew Polk says, ha ha, love the communication strategy. Thanks for the feedback. Drew, thank you so much for showing up, man. I'm grateful for the opportunity to help you out and be your coach here over here on YouTube. Again, thank you so much. If you guys, if you guys are finding this helpful, make sure you guys share this. But more importantly, let's help out the algorithm a little bit. Like, subscribe, hit the notifi notification bell. That way you guys are notified as soon as I load uh, uploading upcoming videos. Again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be your coach. Um, I'll see you guys next week, Monday, 530. I'm committed to you guys. Again, stay committed to your racing, figure out your goals, figure out your intent, start with, with that. Be honest with yourself in terms of where you're at with all your different BMX skills as it pertains to your track skills, your racing skills, your emotional, your emotional and mental skills. And perhaps next week we'll go deep into, um, we'll talk about things like your training environment, your performance team and whatnot. And, and kind of fin finish and wrap finish finish wrapping this up in terms of a a full a full snapshot of what it's like for me to uh, take over and handle and influence a Olympic caliber athletes performance program. Listen, you guys are all Olympic performance caliber athletes to me. Thank you so much. I am grateful for the opportunity to be your coach, and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. You guys have a good one. Have a good week. Work hard. I'll see you guys at the races.